Hey Archeeks, welcome to another video. So today we will be discussing about scientific phenomena that are asked in ICMR exam. And guys, I know you all have been requesting this video from a long time and I'm sorry it took me so long, but here I am with this video. If you like this video, definitely do let me know in the comments so I can make parts to this one as well. So now without much ado, let's get right into this video. So first phenomena we are going to discuss is the flotation of an iron ship. Okay, now these are basically based on the Archimedean principle. Now, let us try and understand why does a ship float? Okay, so the when the ship is in the sea water and it is floating at that point what happens is the average density of the ship is less than that of the density of water and therefore even when a small part of the ship is submerged inside the water it is able to float and how does this satisfy the Archimedean principle see whenever the weight displaced okay weight displaced is equal to the total weight that's when the body is going to float so now the weight of water displaced by the ship is equal to the total weight and therefore the ship is going to float now these ships are mostly loaded with a lot of cargo so here in the ship there is a white line that is marked which is called as a plimsoll line and it marks the safe loading limit up to that point you can load cargo why not behind it beyond it because if at all the load becomes higher then definitely the ship can sink then sometimes there is no cargo at all the ship is flowing empty now if a ship sails empty there is a possibility that strong wind can blow it off and therefore you have something called as the ballast which is filled with water sometimes even sand and stone okay so it is basically added in order in order to you know balance the ship's center of gravity so that it doesn't get tossed off so this is about the flotation of an iron ship which is based on the archimedean principle next is the flotation of submarines so you know that submarines can even sail on the water as well as they can dive in so submarines basically have engines that work on batteries or nuclear energy. Now, when the submarine wants to dive into the water, the ballast tank is filled with water. Now, all the water is taken from the sea and is filled into this portion. Now, what this does is it increases the density of the submarine. So submarine is now more dense than the water. And therefore, what will happen is the submarine will dive into. Now, if the submarine wants to rise, then what is done is basically water is forced out from the ballast tank. And how is that done? By allowing compressed air to enter the tank. So, in this way, again, the submarine can rise up. Next one. So, there can be a question asked in this way that why is it easier for a man to swim or float in sea water than in fresh water so now you can as you can see here at the right side of the panel this is the floating of a man in basically the fresh water and here you can see this is floating of a man in sea water now, can you observe in the sea water, the man's shoulders are way above the water. Whereas here he requires to submerge more of his body into the fresh water. And why is that so? To understand that, we need to know some values. Now, the density of sea water is 1.026 gram per cm3. Whereas that of fresh water is 1. And the density of human body when the lungs is filled with air is 1. So, can you just see that when 
the lungs are filled with water the density is quite similar to that of fresh water and hence you need to submerge more of your body in order to float on the water whereas here in the sea water due to the presence of dissolved salts and minerals the density is higher and because of the higher density less of the body part needs to be submerged in order to be able to float and if you look at the dead sea so the dead sea has a density of 1.16 so without submerging much of your body you will easily be able to float or swim in the dead sea so it is all dependent upon the balance of density so basically if the water's density is lower then you will have to submerge more of the body in order to float so like here here since the density is very similar to that of of the body you have to submerge more part whereas in the dead sea where the density is way higher as compared to that of our body very less amount of your body needs to be submerged next one so next one talks about the sonar and ultrasound now sonar is an acronym for sound navigation and ranging and it is basically used to determine one the depth of the sea or to locate things so suppose you want to locate a seabed or an enemy submarine or fishes ultrasound is used now ultrasound is nothing but ultrasonic waves why do we use ultrasound or ultrasonic waves in a sonar basically ultrasound has a high frequency and that is of 20000 hertz and a very short wavelength therefore it is easily penetrable and hence it is used in sonar sonar is normally uh, sorry ultrasound is normally also produced by bats dolphins cats for the same region of navigation piezoelectric crystals are the source of ultrasonic waves so these can produce ultrasonic waves next one is the principle of the bunsen burner so how basically use the flame can be lit using the bunsen burner so let us try and understand from this figure so can you see here there is the inlet for the gas now gas enters through this and it goes into this part of the burner okay now with a high velocity this gas is moving upwards so it is going into this part of the burner so gas escapes through this nozzle through a very high velocity this high velocity basically lowers the pressure now the pressure inside is lower and hence air will enter from outside via this air holes and come inside over here okay now the air as well as the gas is going to mix and when you ignite this the flame will start burning okay now there is another type of question that they ask you which is the most hottest part of this flame so here i have added another image for that so the lowest part here that is present that is basically containing the unburnt gas or air the tip of the flame is where there is complete combustion and which is the hottest part it is this interface here this part which is the hottest part of the flame okay now next one is the atomizer or sprayer now one thing i forgot to add is this particular working of the bunsen burner works on the bernoulli's principle similarly the atomizer or sprayer also works in a bernoulli's principle now this is something that is basically used in our deodorants and perfume bottles now how does this atomizer work so how does it spray the liquid so basically when you press this balloon okay what happens is air passes through this with a large velocity so when you pump it large velocity passes through 
now here inside if this bottle were transparent you would be able to see that small tubing that goes in which is in contact with the liquid right so when your air enters in okay the tubing that is dipped the air passes over that now when the air passes at a high velocity over that tubing in which the liquid is in which it is dipped basically what happens is the pressure here is reduced and due to the decreased pressure at the top what happens is liquid from the bottom is forced to to rise into that thin tubing and because of that applied pressure and the air that is been gushing out from there the liquid it also the risen liquid along with the air is basically blown outside through the nozzle so this is how the liquid can be pushed out of the nozzle so this as well works on the bernoulli's principle next one is the mirage in the desert so many a times in the desert when it is a very hot day what happens is an illusion is created so at the base of this you see the inverted image of a tree and next to that you see water so basically there is no water present however it seems like there is water at the base of the tree so now we are going to try and understand why is this so so this is based on the principle of total internal refraction so we know there is something called as refraction where there is bending of light reflection is as the light comes it will go back it will be reflected back now one thing you have to remember is total re internal reflection happens only when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle only then the ray will be reflected now let us try to understand how this concept applies over here so now during a very hot day what is going to happen is the sand is going to get very hot right and the air that is in contact is just above the sand will also be hot and therefore this air is the rarer medium okay so air above the sand is hotter and therefore it's the rarer medium now above the air that is just in contact with the sand a little above if we go those more those layers of air will be cooler and they are the denser medium okay now when the ray of light comes from the tree when it is coming down like this what it is going to encounter it is going to encounter the cooler layer of air that is the denser medium and from the cooler layer it is going to go to the hotter one right and that is the rarer medium now whenever light moves from the denser medium to the rarer medium it is going to bend away from the normal now this is going to happen again and again and again and there is going to be a point when the angle of incidence will be greater than the critical angle and that is when the light no more will get ref refracted it will start getting reflected okay so first initially when the light comes here it was getting refracted and this process was going on happening now at a point what will happen the angle of incidence will be lesser as compared to sorry greater as compared to the internal critical angle and therefore the ray of light will get reflected now the light that is reflected will follow the reverse path no it will go from the rarer medium into the denser medium and now when this happens the ray of light will bend towards the normal and finally the it will be perceived in such a way that the tree will appear inverted okay so you will see the tree inverted and this in turn would create a false impression of having water in front of the tree so the mirage in the desert is a result of the total internal reflection next sparkling of diamond so sparkling of diamond is also dependent on total internal reflection so basically you can see that the ray of light enters 
if the angle of incidence is greater than the angle critical angle then the ray of light is going to get reflected and the number of times it will get reflected the more brighter will be the light now the refractive index of diamond is 2.5 and the critical angle theta c is 24 degrees celsius sorry not degrees celsius 24 degree okay so the theta is 24 degree now for total internal reflection to occur what we need is that this angle i should be greater than the angle i that we are going to choose should be greater than 24 degree why because angle of incidence ic is 20 of critical angle ic is 24 degrees so we require the i to be greater and how is this achieved how can we make the i greater than ic by cutting so you must have heard that diamonds are cut so a perfect cut will ensure that there is exactly total internal reflection and no ray of light is lost as a refraction okay if the diamond is not well cut then it will not sparkle much because the ray of light would be refracted instead of total internal reflection okay so this is the sparkling of diamond now there is another substance called as synthetic rutile which has a refractive index of 2.9 and a critical angle of 20 degree and this is one of the most brilliantly sparkling substance that is found so it is another synthetic compound okay next the rainbow now can you just observe this there are two rainbows now when do we usually see rainbows yes so for rainbows we definitely see them during the rainy season now a rainbow is formed when there is sunlight and there are small rain droplets in the air okay now always remember for a rainbow to form okay the sun should be in the opposite direction okay now the phenomena that are play here are refraction internal reflection and dispersion so all of the three together are responsible for forming this rainbow so now the observer should be at the back end and the sun should be in the front so both of them need to be in the opposite direction for you to observe the rainbow okay now these little little droplets that are present they will be doing the major job now always there are two rainbows formed one is this one called as the inner rainbow and the other one called as the outer rainbow the inner rainbow is also called as the primary rainbow and this is the secondary rainbow now if you carefully observe two things can be made out can you tell me what yes one to in the appearance the primary rainbow seems to be more intense as compared to the secondary rainbow the second thing is that in the primary rainbow the red is at the outer part and violet at the inner whereas in the secondary rainbow if you see the violet part is at the outer and the inner part is of red so then why do we observe these two differences that we are going to study so firstly the in the primary rainbow formation what happens is there is a refraction of the ray of light followed by internal reflection and a refraction again so light enters in it is refracted okay after refraction because the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle the ray of light is going to be yes reflected and again while coming out it will be refracted and why is this happening because it is going from a uh, air to the water so different mediums there would be refraction now white light is composed of all these colors and therefore you it will split into the red and blue the rest of the colors are inside now see what happens is when these rays are refracted out of the raindrops 
the red light basically is the one that we see okay so if this is supposed to be the eye so if this is the observer eye what do you notice you notice the red light first right so therefore the upper part of the rainbow looks red now the angle of deviation is also very very important now see what happens is the maximum deviation is for red light so look the red light is the one that has deviated maximum from the normal okay so now the deviation value is 137.8 degree celsius and to calculate the theta it will be 180 minus the maximum deviation that is 42.2 so this angle for red light is 42.2 whereas for violet it is slightly lower that is it is 40.6 and therefore you can see this is upper over here so which light do you perceive you perceive the red one and therefore you will observe this at the outer part okay now in the secondary rainbow what happens is there are two internal reflections see here what was happening refraction total internal reflection again refraction right and you will say where was dispersion so every time there is a refraction see there is a dispersion no? the colors have split white has split into these different colors right now in a secondary rainbow carefully observe see the ray of light is entering okay there is refraction during which dispersion has taken place this is the first reflection first internal reflection this is the second internal reflection and before coming out can you just see what has ha happened the order of the light rays that have entered has reversed right see here here this was red was here and blue was over here now see after reflection the order is reversed and the angles are also different in the previous case the angle for red was 42.2 degrees however here for red it is 50.5 that is it is farther away and therefore the observer is observing this blue light and hence in a secondary rainbow the blue light is at the outer edge okay so whatever you observe at your eye lens is at the outer edge and in this way you have the primary and secondary rainbow now because there are two internal reflections the light intensity gets dimmer okay and therefore the secondary rainbow is less intense as compared to the primary one is that okay hopefully yes if you all have come this far and this video is helping you please like the video comment down below if you want me to do any other specific phenomena or if you want me to continue this series it will be really lovely to read your comments next one is the looming of water can you see this ship appears to be magically flying in the air now why does this happen again this is because of the phenomenon of total internal reflection so actually the position of the ship is over here but we observe it like this such that it is flying so basically what happens is the rays from of light from the ship travel upward like this okay but now since the water here is very cold so you usually observe this in polar countries or where the water the temperature is very low okay so here since the temperature is very low above the cold water okay this part would be denser and the layers above this will be the rarer medium where it is the upper layer so now when light is moving from the denser to the rarer medium it is going to be shifted away from the normal okay and because of this refraction and shifting successive refraction and shifting there will be a point where the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle and therefore when the light is perceived by the observer it appears that the ship is moving upwards okay so it is magically flying 
Next, a short information on laser. So laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Now things to remember is lasers are monochromatic, unidirectional, coherent and intense beams. Okay. And they have very, very little tendency to disperse. And hence you can see them always moving in a straight line. Lasers are always colored and can never be white colored. Why so? Because we know that white light is a mixture of different colors and therefore white light can never be the color of a laser because lasers are monochromatic. Next is something called as light here. I included this because many of the people are mistaken by the name. When you see the name light here, it somewhat seems like it is telling you the time. But no, light here is not a unit of time. It is the unit of distance. And if you have to define it, it is the distance traveled by the light in one year in free space. So how much is one light here? One light here is equivalent to 9.48 into 10 raised to 12 kilometers. And apart from the sun, the closest star to the earth is the Alpha Centauri, which is basically 4.3 light years away from the earth. Now, the next question, very commonly you all must have heard, is the twinkling of the stars. So why do stars twinkle? Before understanding that, I want to let you all know something about the position of the stars. So imagine that you have seen the star over here, okay? You are seeing the star over here. But actually that is not the real position of the star. The star that you are observing is actually a little lower than the position that you can see. And this is called as the apparent shift. And why is this so? This is solely because of the principle of refraction. Okay. So when the light rays from the star come to you, because there is atmosphere in the middle, there is a refraction of light. And this refraction causes the light to bend. And when your brain perceives an image, it traces it back to this source to make a real inverted image which is slightly above the actual one. Okay, so this was just a piece of information. And now why twinkling of stars occurs? So basically, since light, these stars are very far away from each other, they have to travel a long path before they reach your eyes. Now, what happens is when the light passes it, so there's not going to be one ray of light, right? There are going to be many rays coming from the star. Now, when it comes from the space to the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, the density keeps on changing because of the temperature, because of the dust particles, because of the different gases present. Okay, So, it whenever comes in contact with the different densities of the atmosphere, there is continuous refraction of the light. And because of this continuous refraction, there at a particular moment, different amount of intensity of light are reaching it. So sometimes because if the refractions are less, you may perceive a lot of rays coming to you. But if there is a lot of refraction, imagine this light source going there, this light source going there. So actually the one that comes to you is very, very less. Okay. And therefore these stars appear to be twinkling. Then you may ask, do planets twinkle? Yes, planets do twinkle. But we can't see the planets twinkling. And why is that so? Because the planets are bigger. And are they bigger than the stars? No. But they are bigger because they are closer to the earth. And therefore, that planet, when it is closer to us, because of its size being big, the amount of rays, even if they are refracted, they actually don't make much of a difference in the total intensity. And therefore, stars appear to twinkle, but planets do not. So that's it from me from, for today. And hopefully you have gained some information from all these. 
I will be linking all the timestamps. So if at all you want to revisit something, definitely do check it out. And let me know if you want me to make similar videos like this. And that's it from me for today. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.